Now, Rob covered verses, or chapters 1 and 2 last Wednesday. We're going to finish off with chapter 3 this coming Wednesday. Um, our focus this morning is in verses 10 through 13. In verses 1 through 9, right before what we're looking at today, Peter reminds us that this is the time of God's mercy and grace. But because this is the time of his mercy and grace, and we're so used to that, we must not forget that God judges sin. And that's what he speaks about in those first nine verses, that, that God does judge sin. He's going to judge sin. And just because we've known a lot of mercy and a lot of grace, let's not forget that judgment is coming. In fact, every once in a while, God will break into history and remind the human race that he's going to judge sin. The flood. And that's the very event that he speaks about in those verses. Hey, don't forget that God judges sin. That's what the flood was about. Uh, what are some other times in history that God broke into history to remind people that he judges sin? Uh, how about Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Uh, very personally for Israel, uh, their captivity in Babylon and Assyria. God judges sin. Nineveh. Jonah was sent to Nineveh to tell them judgment's coming. Now, they repented, and so God relented of that judgment. But by the way, in history, guess what? He did judge Nineveh. They did. Now, you might say, well, that's all Old Testament, Lance. Well, hold on. New Testament. Can you think of a time in church history when God reminded his people he judges sin? How about Ananias and Sapphira? You know, the church was growing. There was a tremendous love that was being demonstrated. And, and this couple comes in and they lie. And, and the, the, they, they drop dead in church. And it says great fear came upon everybody. Well, darn right it did. Why? God is saying, listen, this is a holy moment. You, yes, this is a time of mercy and grace. That doesn't mean that I've offset judgment. He still judges sin. And, and that's what is written about in verses 1 through 9. And, and, then, and then this reminder that, listen, judgment is coming. And while this is the time of mercy and grace, we need to live our lives right now in light of what's coming. Right? So look at verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. And the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Look again at verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burnt up. As solid as our planet seems, it will one day pass away. The physical universe is a, it's a theater that God has created to erect a stage called earth. And on that stage, a great story is being played out. And when that story is complete, both the stage and the theater will disappear. God will demolish them. They're not needed any longer. And that's what Peter is describing here. He calls it the day of the Lord. From many passages that we find in both the Old and the New Testament, we learn that the day of the Lord is not a 24-hour period. It's not a literal day. It's an era we use the word day ourselves that way. We talk about the day of the dinosaurs. Do we mean 24 hours? No, we mean the era of the dinosaurs. It stretches over a long period of time. Um, we talk about the, the, uh, the day of the apostles. We mean that, that these things were the primary influence, at least in a, in a part of, of the world. How long is the, the day of the Lord? Well, it, it stretches from the rapture of the church through the millennium, when the, the, the physical universe then dissolves and we have a whole new reality. The day of the Lord is when God intervenes directly in the affairs of earth and establishes righteousness. Right now, this is the day of man. 
Because humanity has rebelled against God, the day of man is a time of evil and sorrow. But the day of the Lord, listen, that's Jesus' day. He will take possession of what rightly belongs to him. In the first event to happen in the day of the Lord, when God moves to intervene directly in earthly affairs, human affairs, is the rapture of the church when he takes his people home to heaven. And then it really gets rolling when uh, Christ returns to earth to establish his throne at the beginning of the millennium. It's all going to end then with the dissolving of the physical universe and the arrival of, of a whole new thing. As Peter says here in verse 10, the day of the Lord commences, he said, it's like a thief in the middle of the night. It's it's sudden and unexpected. Again, in verses 1 through 9, Peter warns that things are, are not going to go on forever as they are now. A great story is being played out. There will come a day when that story ends. And the point is that that day... The day of the Lord should not take us by surprise. While the day of the Lord will come to the lost like a thief, it's not that way for us. Here's what Jesus says about all of this in Matthew 24. He says, Watch therefore, for you do not know the hour that your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready For the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. So Jesus was the first one to use this idiom of a thief coming in the middle of the night. Peter uses the same idiom because he's speaking about the same thing. It's precisely because we don't know when Christ will come that we must always be ready. Question, are you ready for the return of Christ? Now speaking of this very same thing, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Paul writes this. Concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. You see, he's using the same idiom, the same image. And then he says this, For when they, meaning the lost, say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them. As labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they, the lost, shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. Listen, all of this points to a pre-tribulation rapture. Now, I know that there's controversy about this, um, even more so these days than there used to be. We believe here at Calvary Chapel that the rapture takes place before the tribulation. If you are of a different persuasion, fine, um, you know, okay. Let me explain to you why we believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. By the way, I just did a six-part series on my YouTube channel on the rapture and why we believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. Uh, One of the more potent reasons to conclude that the rapture takes place before the tribulation is precisely what we find here. It's called the doctrine of imminency. It's the repeated call of both Jesus and the apostles that we must be ready at all times because he could come at any moment. Are we agreed that the Bible says that? He could come at any moment, so be, be ready for it. Because... When Jesus comes for the church, it's business as usual on earth. It's business as usual. In Matthew chapter 24, in Jesus Jesus speaking about this, he says that when he comes, and he means comes for the church, he says two will be in the field, one will be taken, one will be left. One will be sleeping, or two will be sleeping, one will be taken, one will be left. Which is interesting that he uses that idiom, isn't it? Because... He points to the fact that it's global. If you have some that are in the field working and others are sleeping, you see sometime it's day, others it's night. And then he says there'll be some will be grinding mill, uh, two will be grinding mill, one will be taken, another will be be left. There in 1 Thessalonians 5, when the rapture happens, 
the lost. He says, they say peace and safety. And then sudden destruction follows. Okay, hold on. If the, if the rapture happens at the end of the tribulation, you tell me, is it business as usual on earth? The whole central chapters of the book of Revelation are all about the judgments of God. And it says that when he comes at the end of the tribulation, it's to rescue earth from annihilation. You read the plagues about what's going to happen during Revelation. At one point, a third of the world's population is going to be killed off. On a later plague, a quarter of the world's population will be killed off. That means during the tribulation, half of the world's population is going to be killed off. So, at the end of the tribulation, is it going to be business as usual? Is it going to be peace and safety? No. But we find a coming of Christ that happens when people are thinking it's going to be peace and safety. Why? Because it's business as usual. The only way to square the doctrine of imminency with what we learn about the coming of Christ for his people is that the rapture happens before the tribulation. It's when it's business as usual. And then sudden destruction comes. Both Peter and Paul urge believers to live as though Christ could return at any moment because the day of the Lord, which begins with the rapture, is imminent. Peter describes how the physical creation will end. Look at what he says there in verse 10. The heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be, what? Burnt up. Now that aligns perfectly with what we know about the structure of physical matter. Help me out. You all took physical science in high school. Matter is made up of what? Atoms. And what are atoms made up of? Protons. Boy, some of you were like, I, I've forgotten. I, I don't remember. Don't do this to me. Protons, neutrons, and... Electrons. Okay, now, you, you will remember this. Like charges repel. They do not attract. Like charges repel. Protons are positive. They're in the nucleus of the atom. What's holding the nucleus of the atom together? It's all... The, 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 the Sunday school answer works perfectly here. Yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's a, for those of you that don't know, you, you ask a, a, a class of kids any question in Sunday school, the answer is always God. <laughs> God or Jesus, right? <laughs> Jack gets a gold star. So you have the, you have the nucleus of the atom. It's got protons. The, the, you know, the heavier of the matter, the more protons are packed in there. What's holding it together? Physicists don't know. It's a mystery. They do not know. I mean, they've suggested all kinds of theories, but they simply don't, none of these theories can be tested. We don't know what holds the center of the atom together. Something does. It's a mystery to us. It's a mystery to physicists, but may I say it's not a mystery to us because the Bible tells us. And Colossians 1.16, by Christ, all things were created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible and invisible. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things consist. That word consist means are held together. You want to know how the center of every nucleus is held together? Christ is holding it together. But when this isn't needed anymore, he lets it go. And then notice what Peter says. It ends with a loud noise and great heat. And that is a perfect description of a nuclear explosion. That's what happens in a nuclear explosion the nucleus of the atom, all those protons, fly apart. There's tremendous release of energy, and of course, there's a very loud sound. We don't know how the universe began. You know, the, the suggestion is that it started with a Big Bang. I'll tell you what, a Big Bang is certainly how it's going to end. <laughs> Peter's concern wasn't to give us a technical, technical description of how the universe ends, his point is there at the end of verse 10. Look at what he says. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. It's all going to go bye-bye. Verse 11, therefore. Here's the lesson. Since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be 
and holy conduct and godliness. Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. Because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire. And then the elements will melt with fervent heat. Since all this is destined to dissolve, what ought we live for? Either we live for things that won't last or the things that do. We all need, we all need a place to live and we need transportation and clothes and food. But where we live, what we drive and wear and eat, these things are not the measure of our lives. Far more important is the kind of person that we are and we are becoming. What, what do you spend your time, your talent, and your treasure in the pursuit of? What are you spending yourself for? We've conducted a lot of memorials over the years here. Some have a, a lot of people come out. We've had, we've had memorials here with 300 people. We've had others with a dozen, two dozen people. Some are more known, more honored than others. Most memorials, uh, we have a time of sharing. There's a, a microphone that we set up and we invite people to come up and share. And... Um, you know what I've never heard at, at a single memorial? Rob, Rob is the one that coordinates all of our memorials for us these days. Uh, Rob, I don't think I've ever heard in the time of sharing, people get up and says, oh yeah, that guy had a dope car. Never heard it. No, yeah, wow, their house was amazing. Uh, no one gets up and says, man, they were a fancy dresser. Man, you should, they're, they're, man, they're, wow, their wardrobe was just, yeah. Never heard it. Think about the memorials you've attended where there's been the open mic. Have you ever heard that? What do people say when they get up? They were, they were a good person. They, um, they had an impact on me. What thrills Rob and I when we, because we attend memorials, what, what thrills us is to hear someone get up and say, I worked with the deceased. I knew they were a Christian I had no interest. In fact, I made fun of them. But then something happened in my life and, and I went to them and they prayed for me and, then I, and they invited me to church and I went and, and I'm a believer now. Man, yes. Or, or they, they had such a great marriage and they became a model for me or they were such a great mom or a dad and it was a real model for me on how to raise my kids. What people share at a memorial is not the stuff that people owned or what they drove, or where they lived, it was, it's always about their character, every single time. And what's sad is when there's an open mic and no one gets up to talk. People come to the service to show honor to the family, but there's nothing to say about the person. What are you living for when you're gone? What are you going to leave behind? What's your legacy? What are you spending yourself in the pursuit of? Since, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? What kind of person are your choices making you? Two men sit down to play a game of Monopoly. One is poor, the other is wealthy. As they're playing Monopoly, the roll of the dice allows the poor man to get all the property, all the little cards, all the money, and all the little plastic houses and hotels. The rich man loses. And when the game is over, the rich man climbs in the back of his limousine and drives to his mansion and has a gourmet meal. The poor man is homeless. His lunch is from a dumpster. This world is a Monopoly game. This world is a monopoly game. And people have sat down to play the game, putting all their interest and all their energy and all their time and everything into amassing stuff that is going away. It's going to dissolve. And they count you and I as losers. Because we aren't living for the things of this world. We are not storing up treasure on earth. We're storing it up in heaven. 
You can't take it with you, but you can send it on ahead. We are storing up treasure in heaven. The world looks at us and says, what, what do you have to show for life? What's happening in here? The impact that I'm having on others. That, that's, that's what I have to show. They don't value that. They, they think we're losers because we're living a deferred life. This, for them, from heaven's perspective, this is actually that. In reality, this is this. By the way, don't anybody come up and say, oh, that's fake, that's fake too. So I just, I don't have a hundred dollar bill. Peter says something remarkable there in verse 12. Look at what he says. Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. Looking for. We do that by heeding Jesus' and the apostles' repeated call to watch and be ready for Christ's return. Looking for it. We can hasten we can hasten, this is amazing, isn't it? Hastening the return of Christ? How do we do that? He taught us to pray. Your kingdom come, what? Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When you pray that prayer, you're saying, Lord, come. Bring your throne. Maranatha, Lord, come. Do you know that's how the Bible ends? The Bible ends. The book of Revelation, read it at the end. Here, here's what, the, here's what we, we pray. Maranatha, Lord, come. Come quickly. Come, Lord. That's, we can haste, we can actually haste. This world needs Jesus. It needs Jesus. But there's another way we can hasten the day of the Lord, the return of Christ. And that's by living the power of the gospel. When the lost see the power of Christ to change a life, to give hope and meaning and purpose and genuine satisfaction and joy, when the lost see that, they realize life isn't about houses and cars and wardrobe. It's, it's about character. It's about the weight of a life lived well. And they want in. And there is someone somewhere, as the Apostle Paul speaks in Romans chapter 11, verse 25, he speaks of the fullness of the Gentiles, that when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, then Christ comes. Listen, there's someone somewhere that's that last person that when they're saved, the Father will turn to the Son and say, go get them. Who knows? That last person might live in Oxnard. And you might be the one whose life they watch. And then some simple word that you share with them is what sees them come over into faith in Christ. Verse 13, as we end, Nevertheless, we, according to His promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. That look, we look for, it's actually in the active, it means we are, we're ever looking for, we're ever looking for it. I, a word of a word of encouragement and exhortation, if I could. Uh, over the years, I've spoken to so many who hear about the rapture and the coming of the Lord, and, and they're, they, you know, they're like, oh, well, yeah, that'd be great, but I, I want, you know, I, I, I want them to wait until I go to Maui. Or I go to Israel. I've got my deposit in. I'm going to Israel. Can, if the Lord would just wait till I go to Israel. And then when we go back to the airport and we're ready to fly home, then he can come. <laughs> Listen, when Jesus comes, you're going to get a free trip to Israel. Hallelujah. Okay? All right? The, the real Israel. <laughs> Heaven's much better than Israel. I, I understand that. You're young. I want to get married. I want to have kids. 
And then when you're married and you have kids, and I want to, I want, I want to see my kids get married and have, I want grandkids. And then you have grandkids. <laughs> nothing's better than the presence of Christ. Nothing's better. Nothing's better than heaven. So, so looking for. Be looking for the Lord to come. Be looking for, be eager for it. And if your heart's not in that place, that's what you can pray today. Lord, make me eager for your return. I want, to be, I want to be looking for it. I want to be anticipating. I want to be yearning for it. I want to be leaning into that. You Watch what happens when your heart becomes in this place where, Lord, please come. You're going to have a whole new perspective on your life, the life of others around you. What's happening in our world, it's all good. You wouldn't shell out $35,000 for a car that you knew was going to brick in a week, would you? You wouldn't put down a half a million dollars on a house you knew was going to burn down in a month. <laughs> you wouldn't uh, go to college to get a degree in a, in a field, in a subject that you knew was going to be obsolete in a year. Why, why invest all of that time and energy in something you know that isn't it's not going to be there. Do you realize that's, that's what Peter is saying? Of course, of course we need a car and we need a house and we need an education. Of course we do. But those things aren't supreme. They're not premier in our lives. God is. Invest yourself in your relationship with God. Yes, we need all these other things, but that's not where our, that's not the core of our our substance and our being, our meaning, our relationship with God is. Those things are temporal. You are eternal. I, I, I shared this illustration some time ago. It works this morning again. Is there a time in your life you wish you could go back to with what you know now and counsel yourself? For me, it's the three years I spent in fifth grade. <laughs> Man, if I could go back to when I was 16 with what I know now and have a chat with myself, wouldn't that be awesome? We probably still wouldn't listen to ourselves because at 16, you know everything. You say, no, I'm you. I'm a 68-year-old you. 16-year-old Lance, listen to me. <laughs> I think the essence of what Peter is saying is that we can do that because he's told us about our future, where we will be and what we will be in a realm of godliness and righteousness. And we will be in perfect union with God. And all of this is going to go away and it's going to all be new and the only thing that matters is our relationship with God. Amen. So, think about what you will be and who you will be then. What would that you tell this you? What counsel? What advice? 